Good morning to you. Nice to see all of you today. And on the internet, we're glad you're here also. I want to thank you all for your prayers over the last few weeks. Uh, my brother Gary, who I've known longer on this earth than anybody besides my mother, uh, passed away a week ago Friday. And uh, we had a wonderful service for him back there, a here, little celebration. We'll see him again, and for that I am thankful. Let's go to prayer, can we please? Heavenly Father, as the song goes, you are an awesome God. You take care of our needs, Lord, even sometimes when we forget to ask. You're always there for us, always listening. Always got your hand underneath our elbow, helping us to get down the path. And we're thankful for pictures of heaven. We're thankful for the pathway of gold, which gold won't be important when we get there like it is here. It'll just be a pretty road. We're thankful for the gates. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. And what he did for us, which enables all of us to be together someday. We are truly thankful for that. Be with us this morning as Rick brings us the message. Uh, just speak through him in a mighty way, Lord, as we're working ourselves through this wonderful book of Daniel. We're thankful for what you do for each of us. Lord, if there's someone here or even on the internet watching that just needs a little something extra, help them out. Help them to ask. You have promised us that anything we ask from our heart, you will grant. And so if there are issues or relationships or jobs or whatever it might be, that we just lay it at the foot of the cross. And you take care of it. I'm thankful for these people that are watching on the internet and the people that are here in person. Open our hearts now, Lord, to what you would have us here today as Rick brings us this message. And we ask these things, Lord, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you for that. Before you continue on uh, with the service this morning, uh, I'd like to ask uh, each of the pastors to come up, and uh, please, uh, I'd like to also ask the wives to come up also, uh, Johnny and Vicki and uh, Rick and Julie, uh, Peter and uh, Susan, Suzanne, if you'd join uh, Michael the there. of uh, pastor appreciation, and uh, so we wanted to do a little... Th a little something this morning to uh, show our appreciation to our pastoral staff here. So if you want to come over here, yeah, it's kind of group hug here, sort of. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. From uh, So we wanted to do something special for you all this morning. So on behalf of uh, the congregation, I wanted to... Uh, pass, uh, give you each a little something special, and then I want to take a moment to pray for you all. All right, thank you. Uh, let's, let's, uh, 
if you just if you want to stand or uh, if you want to come up here, if anybody if wants to come up here just to you know stand by them at all, that's fine. Or just uh, you know to put your hand toward them uh, as I pray. Lord, I thank you for each one of these uh, who you have brought to us, Lord, uh, to to teach us and to, uh, uh, to to lead us in your in your word, Lord, in in the the preaching of your word, and the study of your word, Lord. I pray that you'd guide and direct uh, Michael and Suzanne and uh, Johnny and Vicky and Rick and Julie and Peter and Marsha, Lord, as because. Uh, Particularly the, as the men as they serve, but Lord, uh, when you call people, you call husband and wife together, Lord. And I just pray that you'd uh, uplift them, Lord, and that you'd guide them in, and direct them in their homes, Lord, that they would honor and glorify you in their homes, Lord, and that you'd uh, help them as they, they serve together, and that uh, you'd bless them and uh, make them fruitful, Lord, that you'd guide them and direct them, that they would uh, seek always seek your face, Lord. I just ask these things in uh, Jesus' name. In, amen. Wow. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. I, I brag on you guys everywhere we go. Our, our little church that just keeps on giving in so many ways. We've got the uh, Christmas boxes back there, by the way, so... All right, up. would you take your Bibles, please, or you can look on the screen. And we're looking at the book of Jeremiah right now. Rick's working me to death with one scripture here today, but it's a biggie. Jeremiah 29, and we're looking at verse 13. And it says this, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amen? Yes. Amen. I know he's helped me a lot over the last couple of weeks. Especially. Good morning, kids. I again brought my trash bag to church, and uh, this is the last day these uh, items will be here, uh, maybe for many reasons. It may go into the bylaws. I was going to be a little rude there for it to him. This one is a what? Good. You know, it's important that we, and you can start turning in your Bible to this. Uh, seventh chapter sorry bud hang in there of Daniel and we're going to look at today this this piece that was capturing the attention of Daniel oh I have to let it stand there on its own. That'll work. It's important that we take a look at this chapter, not because it's the most complex chapter, not because it's so hard to understand. A lot of it is hard to understand because we don't know our Bibles that well. We haven't spent time. And this piece that last week we talked about this, this, this study of the Word of God uh, is revelatory to us, and especially when there's the work of the Holy Spirit, at work of bringing us this revelation about what he's saying. And today we're going to take a look at the same verses we looked at last week. Because the point is, is that this man, Daniel, he was looking. And uh, if you're in the, this uh, first part of the seventh chapter, uh, you can see what he's talking about. And he begins to share about 
the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. We talked about that last week, that this is the seventh chapter goes back 14 years uh, to the first year of Belshazzar. And so this piece is important to know because there's a reason for it. Daniel saw it said a dream and uh, visions in his mind and as he lay on his bed and then he wrote down the dream and told the following summary of it. And he talks about what he was looking at, what God was showing him. But this, young, this guy, he wasn't a young guy by this time, he was my age, 68-ish. It talks about he was looking in such a way that he knew he was going to be a, a messenger of what was being shared. And he knew that the value of this from God as a revelation was so important that he had to take a look at it with open ears. So many times when we read the Bible, we're, we're looking at it uh, for a lot of times of getting through a struggle or uh, getting through a hard time or we need information or we need money or we need something all right, from the Lord. And we're looking for that which will comfort us, which will quiet us down a little bit. We're looking for something that will give us direction and momentum. He's not looking at it like that. He's looking because God is sharing something with him that requires him to have a stewardship in regard to what is being said. It's a shift for us believers sometimes because the Bible is there as a revelation of the person of who God is. And he's doing it in such a way where he wants us to grab who he is in the midst of the message. He says the scripture that Michael read moments ago out of Jeremiah, and you will seek me and then you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, for most of us, we don't know when we've ever done something with all of our heart. We always think, well, I could have done more. I should have been less this and more that. What he's talking about is that we've given him uh, his, our attention and to no one else. We're not looking to somebody else. We've given him our attention. Husbands in here, there's been times perhaps in your uh, uh, experience with your wife where you uh, think you got what she says. You think you understand what she's communicating. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. In fact, we'll summarize or we'll paraphrase to her and we'll, th we'll say, well, well, this is what you were communicating. And then we'll ask a question, is that correct? And they'll look at us and go, absolutely not. You didn't get any of it. Because our focus was more about how we listen rather than listening. There's methods by which we listen and we become a prejudiced listener. And to do that with the Word of God ends up being that the, the message comes across to us in an opaque manner. It's like we're trying to communicate with God, but everything he says and everything we get out of it, man, it's just not clear. If you seek me, you'll find me. When you search for me, when it's just you and me. And so Daniel, as he comes to this moment, he's listening. He knows that God's desire is to be known by those he created, and Scripture exists for that very purpose because he desires that we know him. And so as we come to this seventh chapter, we see these pieces, and God has made Daniel ready for this mission that he's got because Daniel's been through the boot camp as a young man. He's listened to the Lord about what to draw the line in regards to what he ate, what they ate. He's listened to the Lord when the, <laughs> when the assassin was at the door to kill him and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. He listened and he asked a great question. What's the rush? And then he asked for permission to pray and seek the Lord that the, the king would have not only a dream interpreted, but an accurate 
interpretation of really what God is saying. He's practiced, folks, a long obedience. Long obedience is not the sprint. It's not the inspire moment. Long obedience is the marathon. I'll seek you every morning. I'll walk with you, the Lord, day by day. It's knowing that in the hardships and in the trials, there is, there is so much for us, but we don't miss the point that we become like Daniel and that we become couriers of the message. And so we find this guy, he was, he was looking at this vision, but he's looking at this vision, folks, in the, in, by seeing in the realm of pure spiritual understanding. Last week we looked at the scripture that to a natural man, the, the things of the Spirit seem crazy. I mean, it's crazy. But of the Spirit and in the Spirit, there becomes a revelation to where not only do we become wiser or we get better information, but we know Him in a way that cannot be had in any other way than by listening and obeying Him. Daniel has seen and experienced a revelatory vision granted by God. Not so that he survives Babylon. Not so that he eventually gets back to Jerusalem. Not so that he has a, hus- a wife and, a, and children. Not so that he has enough money to pay his bills. Because God is using Daniel and the, and the, the Jewish guys with him as a testimony in a faraway and a Gentile land. Daniel is looking because God was not only revealing something to him, but he was entrusting him with it. That it not only worked through the fiber of Daniel's life, but it also was something that gave accuracy to those that that Daniel ran into. It gave them something where there was a coherence in the message. Where the parts of the message not only became understandable, but they became something that gave life and hope to the church down through the centuries. The Jews down through the centuries till we find ourselves in our moment with the culmination of these beasts at work. And really what is going on? What's behind this message? What's going on? I looked out a little bit ago, and it's starting to get kind of dark out there. And sometimes we go into these this portions of Scripture, and it, as the clouds start to form, and we start thinking, oh, oh I, hope, I hope he doesn't come back before I get married. I was just praying I'd have a little hair left at the wedding. That's what I was, I was interceding for that, all right? That there's something about this in trusting he gave him his attention as a witness but not as an eyewitness if you study law at all you'll find out the eyewitness at a crime scene is the worst witness there is it was a blue truck bluish maybe it was green i think there was a lady in it maybe it wasn't a truck at all and it becomes something to where as we think through of being an eyewitness because we get emotionally engaged we miss out on really what was there he's not an eyewitness he finds himself being this witness that in his hands are open because now it's going to be the stewardship. There's going to be this way of participating with this word personally, but also this way of this word uh, getting to this place in the community, into the family, into the world that wouldn't otherwise make it that way. He's a courier. Um, I'm going to give you one example of a courier that happened during World War II. It happens in our times as well. But a courier, you've seen them in movies. They've got a satchel around their shoulders. They're running through and hiding behind and moving towards because they have a message to take to parts of the army that are separated from one another. And this information has to be shared. And it's something that has to do with where, where we're going next and what's happening next and what you're supposed to do next. And so this courier is making his way through the brambles and the, and, the, and, the, and the battlefield. 
And then in the movie, you'll see the bullets coming, and the courier falls on the ground. And in reality, when that courier would fall to the ground, the enemy would pour more fire into that dead body. Because the message is on the lips of the courier. There's something about this place of listening that Daniel stepped into that's not just because he was a good listener, he was a good steward. It's a testimony of how the word should apprehend us, not emotionally, emotions do follow, but in a sense that God is communicating something to us and he's entrusting us with that word. Psalm 63, 2 says this, God, you are my God, I shall be watching for you. It's not just my quiet time, it's not just my time through my devotional, I'm watching for you. Daniel, this guy was watching for him. Let's take a quick note. We talked a little bit about the Holy Spirit last week. Here's another little piece before we get into these, uh, these animals, what he saw. The Holy Spirit, folks, seeks our welcome and our invitation. That God is not subjected to man, but the value of our experience with God is based on our what? Our attention and our invitation. Well, can he just knock me in the head with a rock and get it into me? Can he just give me something? I mean, download it? See, there's, there's this aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. This is John 14, 16, and 17. Jesus is speaking. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Jesus has been the shepherd. He will and always will be. But his mode and method of shepherding shifts with his resurrection. He says, I'll give you another helper so that he may be with you when you're in desperate times. Doesn't say that. Does yours say that? He'll be with you when you need an extra little help at work or an extra little cash. He'll be with you. I think one of the things that I know I have had to repent of in my life as a Christian is saying, God, you seem far away. I've had to repent of that. It misrepresents him. And he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I may feel that God is far from me, but it's me who stepped over here and looked at the, the problems and how big it is and how hard it is. It, I've left the conversation. Don't you love it when you're talking to somebody and they get a phone call or they get a text and they're no longer looking at you? Oh, yeah, I'm listening to you. No, you're not. We hate that moment. We feel like something's cut the conversation in half. Well, he hates it too. The helper, verse 17, is the spirit of truth from the world, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. He's talking about the work of the Spirit that is ongoing, gets us to the, this, to, to the Savior, and Savior gets us to the Father. It's the work of the Spirit, but he's talking about this in you part. There's something about this that everybody who's experienced this infilling of the Spirit is better than they were before. It's the truth. To, to receive. John 7.39 says this, But this Jesus spoke of the Spirit, whom, who, uh, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Spirit was still at work. I mean, we're talking about Daniel and, and the work of the Spirit in Daniel. But this word receive is a great, great Greek word, lambano. It means to receive, to, to obtain. Mick was up here, he's handing out envelopes. And he handed it. 
And not one of us said, are you handing that to me? Why are you giving it to me? I don't even know who what you're giving it to me for. I mean, this could have, this could have, uh, what's the, what's the plague that's in envelopes now? This could have some disease in it, okay? You could be handing me your bills, all right? But we received it. We don't know what's in it. See, we put so much value on understanding that we will trade the lack of understanding and miss a visitation. This receiving means to, it means to, to, to receive him like in Romans 8 it talks about the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. What kind of deal is that? The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. I want to contrast for a moment and be able to, to take us to a place in this moment regarding the Holy Spirit where we can see that there are two things that we can actually do that are not good to the Holy Spirit. Number one, we can grieve him. This is out of Ephesians 4.30. It says, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But if there is any good word for ed- but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that. So that it will be give grace to those who hear. He's saying that there's something about our behavior in situations that represents that God is with us. It, then it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Then it says, all bitter, let, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander uh, must be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another. He's saying he sandwiched this word about grieving the Holy Spirit into this sentence that's talking about what the meat of the moment is. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. To grieve him means that what we're doing is we're setting, we're devaluing him. He's not sensitive He's not like, oh, you, you offended me, I'm out of here. He's saying you act as if I don't exist. You live uh, the way that you think you should live because somebody's made you mad. Or because some situation has happened. Or because you just don't know him and we pretend that we do. It's a big word. We devalue him. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Then it says, do not quench the spirit, do not utterly reject prophecies, but examine everything, hold firm to, what, to that which is good, abstain from every evil. Can, how we live means that not this quenching, means to the to suppress, to stifle divine influence. The Holy Spirit has never split a church. Humans do. There's something about this, 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 this understanding of what's going on and the need as we are in the Word, the need to live from the Word, the need to understand that we are listeners and participants with God and we are receivers of this work of the Holy Spirit that gives us something that no historical study can give us. We can read all the old dudes and we can grab their concepts, but then we go to people and we have none of our own. How many of you in here, women, how many of you have your mom's favorite cookie or some recipe at home? You do. And they pass it down, haven't they? I remember a, a lady in our church, uh, she passed uh, about a year ago. And she, like, looked around. She had a recipe book. I was in her house. She looked around, make sure no one else around. She goes, and, man, she goes, you can copy this one. <laughs> It's a treasure, all right? And yet here God gives us this treasure and we let somebody figure it out for us. Can you imagine that, guys, when you were all Google-eyed over your honey? Can you imagine? 
that did anything else fill your vision? You had counted her eyelashes. You knew, man, you just want to spend every waking hour. Now you're on the phone with her for two seconds. Well, back then you were on the phone for two hours. Because there was a love relationship. We give Jesus our love. We do. We give God our love. But man, we are suspicious of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, we've seen it happen. John and I have seen this happen in our younger years where people didn't know what to do with the, 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 the opposing things that began to happen in the church. And they became so opposing, the Holy Spirit just stepped back. We haven't seen him move like that since. That doesn't mean he's not moving. It just means there's a difference, folks, between doing something that takes sweat and effort and doing things that are by the Spirit. There is a world of difference. Most believers have never experienced that contrast. And we need to. So as we get into the meat of this seeing something, let's take a look at uh, these little critters up here. Because he's going to see something as he goes through this portion of Scripture. He's going to see something that looks like a, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast. But then he's going to see what's different about them from a natural lion or a natural leopard. He's asking the man, I want you to see the difference I'm bringing up. I want you to see it. I want you to catch something that's lion-like. I want you to catch it. What that would mean as you go through Scripture about lions, it's amazing what it says about lions. And their ferocity, right? I mean, Daniel was not hurt by him, but the folks they threw in after Daniel, man, he hurt some people. He, they devoured them. They broke or crushing their bones before they hit the floor. There's something about a lion. But there's also some notary about the lion. The lion is like the king. Uh, it's been called the king of beasts. All right. He represents also this royal work. We'll see later on where Jesus is the lion of Judah. But what he's talking about here in the description of these animals, he's talking about this word judgment. He's talking about judgment. Now when you think judgment, some of us are in here thinking, I'm going to stand before God, man. He's going to judge me. And that's going to be a tough day or a moment. <laughs> I'm not he's not talking about that is judgment and that is coming. But what he's talking about is a judgment that takes place in a legal setting. Judgment that occurs in regard to all human governments. And he's beginning to describe to us who are the folks in that courtroom when that judgment occurs? Who are the representatives of the prosecution? They're sitting before you. And what and who is sitting in there in terms of the defense? Because judgment decrees at the point of whether somebody is guilty or innocent decrees that what's going to happen from then on is going to operate in line with this judgment that's been made. And we see in this circumstance, it says this. We, we read last week uh, in verse um, 2. 
that he saw the behold these four winds. Anytime you see four, really in the Bible describing something, it means the culmination, the fulfillment. Are there, should there be a zoo full of animals? No. Every human kingdom is represent, represented by some characteristic of these four. It talks about four winds, right? He's saying these winds from the north, south, east, and west were bringing together something to stir up. We talked about it's not an ocean of water. It's humanity that this is an ocean of. comes out of Revelation 17. And it says, out of that stirring up, these four beasts are revealed. And they were different from one another. Verse 3. Daniel 4.17 says this. It says, the first was like a lion. And the characteristics of a lion that we described briefly. So that's what a lion looks like, or a lion is. But what about this lion? It says this lion is going to have what? Wings, like an eagle. And it says, I kept looking. Man, keep looking. See, once you've read the devotion, and Francois has told you about that passage, Put Francois aside. In fact, before you get to the devotional, go to the Word yourself and ask God to give you the revelation about that Word. He kept looking. He saw this lion with wings. And at first, our impression would be, man, that's weird. But he kept looking until his wings were what? Plucked. This word plucked here, how many of you ever plucked a chicken? All right. You're ridding that chicken of feathers. This word plucked here means he plucked those feathers of that eagle wings clean. There was no feathers left. And he says this. And it was lifted up from the ground because... An eagle without wings is going to be where? On the ground. He lifted up uh, from the ground and set, up, set, up, it set him up, or this, this lion, set him up on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. Now, I'm not interpreting. I'm just looking. Are you looking? We want to say, okay, what in the sandbox does this mean? But see, Daniel is getting the personalities straight. This is what I'm seeing. My mind cannot figure out what he's saying or interpreting, but I'm not going to interpreting, and I'm not going to application. I'm just looking. So I see this lion has wings. They're plucked. Hits the ground. I see the Lord raise him up, give him legs. And what's next? Gives him a human mind. This piece in history, folks, has already happened. You've already read about it. If you take a look at the kingdom of Babylon, it's made up of a long, long, thousands of years history of how it got down to becoming the kingdom of Babylon. The, Amer- the Akkadians, the Samaritan, the Sumerians, the Assyrians, all these cultures intermixed, fought each other, overcame one another, gave in to each other, and over time it matriculated down to this kingdom of Babylon. And Babylon, folks, was perceived and looked at. In fact, their symbol was a lion in terms of on their shields, on their gates, because the lion was so fearsome. They weren't picking it for any other reason. And they were lifted up on all the wind of all their their history and their ancestors and they were lifted up to this place, man, where Babylon's up here, exalted. It's like, wow, man, nobody can touch those guys. See, Daniel knew what he was, this, this was, 
in ref- reference to. He knew. He's not interpreting it. He's just saying, man, I know this story. And I know that Babylon was lifted up. And, ba- and Daniel was there and gave a word to Nebuchadnezzar about a dream that he had had, that Nebuchadnezzar had had. And in this dream that he would be what? Because of his pride, he would be what? Humbled. Those wings were plucked. And he hit the ground. And seven years, he crawled around on the ground like an animal. And then what? His mind is restored to him. And he stood up. And he says this about the Lord. <laughs> uh, you've all read it. It's a pretty good one. He says that the Lord is so unique, so different. It's going to be the last page, you know that, don't you? All right. I can't find it at the moment. He exalts the Lord. And he's not saying, wow, this God of Daniel and the boys, whew, he's awesome. No, he's saying, he's saying he knows. He knew that God was exactly who he said he was and was accomplishing exactly what he said he would do. And this peace of righteousness that took place in this guy's life This is back in chapter 4, verse 37. Now I, the former guy crawling on the ground eating grass. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. The king of heaven, he now knew, was the king of every kingdom on earth. For all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. See this lion in the courtroom is a different representation than the other three. Because the kingdom of Babylon was broken, pagan, worshiping, broken. But the God of Babylon has set a precedent of what his God is able to do because he's the king of kings. He set a precedent. This testimony stands. Uh, this testimony is on the front end and trumps all others that would come after it. And that's why 14 years later when Belshazzar gets the goods out of the temple to have their wine in, Daniel doesn't present him with an option of, hey, let me reiterate what was said. It was the end of that kingdom that night. To go back after you've had this president means there's no other thing because there is judgment because something has happened in your midst that God is saying this is who I am this is what I've done. So there's this, this, this lion in the legal setting. Can you see him in there? Wings plucked, lifted up, on two feet. God gave him a human mind. Let him repent in the middle of this broken and evil kingdom. Which says to all kings and kingdoms that if you will repent and come to me, though you be as far away as the heavens are from the earth, this is Nehemiah's prayer, and I'll bring you back to me. So there's one in this courtroom, this arena of judgment, that's saying something to the lowliest broken Gentile on earth. Spoke it loud and clear to me years ago. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God planted four Jewish boys, there may have been others, in this evil kingdom, and they became light in a dark place, 
even to the point of this revelation, isn't being given in the city of Jerusalem regarding the end times. It's being given in this most broken and dark kingdom of Babylon. What's being shown in Daniel is what's being presented at a trial, a testimony and evidence of the prosecution's case. That was what had been taken by Adam's forfeit in terms of sin coming in the world. A godless way of administrating the world and its people is going to have to be judged because sin's still in the world. It's going to have to be judged. And that's why we see these same pictures in the book of Revelation. They're coming. But you're not going to read these anymore and go, golly, where, I want, give me one of those charts that looks like the inside of a computer to understand the end times. It's not that way. The second one, this bear was raised up on one side. How many of you have experienced a bear, live bear, not, not a zoo bear? Sean, you have, Julie has. Whoa, Patty, I believe it. I believe that one. These are just snippets I'm going to give you for a second. Man, there is something about a bear, folks. And the Bible talks about the bear and what it does. It says in this, in the scripture, it says, And behold, the other beast, the second one, resembling uh, a bear. And it was raised up on one side. And three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. When you see three in the Bible, it's resurrection, but it's also talking about Trinity. There's a trinity that's portrayed in the Bible being the trinity. And there's also a trinity that's portrayed in these kingdoms that's a false trinity. Mimics. It's an unholy trinity. These, these ribs, he's going to talk about them later, what they are. But he said this to it. Arise, devour much meat. If you were sitting at a table at the restaurant with the bear, you would have nothing to eat. The table would get broken. All right? The room would be tore up. The door would be broken because the bear wanted out. You can't imagine how powerful a bear is. You can't imagine how powerful they are. They are docile. You want to hug them, but, but, but Ben, don't do it. Because they rise up. They are they are like a cuddly stuffed animal until they're not. He's saying to these nations, folks, that are like this, they devour, they take and eradicate. We've seen it in the Assyrians. We've seen it in the Babylonians. They take and eradicate. They make everything that they take look like what they are. The Assyrians, you had to be Assyrian, you had to dress Assyrian, you had to live Assyrian, you had to do Assyrian laws, you had to change, you were dead if you were conquered by them. There's a country in our world today that's like the bear. It is, it is. They just want to take, think it belongs to them because they're motivated by fear. That in the courtroom is this devourer Right. You know how big a moose is? Moose is big, aren't they? Uh, a bear can eat a whole moose at one sitting and cracks the bone, just devours it. In this legal setting is this bear, part of the prosecution, a devourer. Because what's going to happen in terms of the fulfillment of these pieces that are here in Daniel 7. We're going to see them again in Revelation. We're going to see some of them in Ezekiel. We're going to see that these characters and what they're like keep going. Okay? The bear in Revelation is no di different than the bear we're describing right now. Verse 6 says what? After this, I kept what? I kept looking. 
Wouldn't this kind of cork your pistol? I mean, first couple of them, wouldn't it be like, whew, man, that was a lot to take in, no? See, the messenger has to, has to grab the whole message to the point where in the first verse, it says that Daniel, Daniel summarized what he had seen. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard. As you go through the scripture, I, and if anybody wants copies of my notes, you're certainly welcome. But I looked at the leopards in the Bible. The leopards are not like a lion. They're a cat, but they're not like a lion. They're not like a bear. Leopards lie in wait. They utilize stealth to catch their prey. A leopard cannot run 100 yards full speed. When they catch you, it's bad news. But they catch you because they lie over here next to the road. I kept looking at another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings and had four heads. And dominion was given to it. Anytime you see four, what does it mean? We had four winds. It means this is the culmination in terms of the nations of the world that are given dominion to dominate. The Romans were dominators. They would go in and take a country or a city, but they would let you keep your customs and your way of dress. They would, wait, they would let you keep the way of commerce. They would let you even have a, a, a thought that you were free, even though you were under Roman law. Because that is a way that nations are dominated. There's enough freedom. Yeah, you can buy something from Amazon. No problem. Have at it. Enjoy it. But don't ever speak against Caesar. Because Caesar's God. There is a domination that takes place. Let them believe that they are free. It's a way of government that it lies by the roadside, that waits, that's cunning and dangerous. They say, man, that's, that's the, in the courtroom, but it represents a human kingdom, a human government. Because these things, folks, are not going to happen in just Israel. These things are not going to ha just happen in some faraway nation, like in Rome. Well, <laughs> Rome's a city. All right, number seven, or verse seven. And he kept what? He kept looking. In the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, extremely strong. And it had a large mouth of iron teeth. It devoured and crushed. Look at these feet, trampled. Trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from the other beasts. We have kingdoms and human government that are still like the bear and still like the leopard. But this one, these two will give way to this one. Because the beast owns what he possesses. He owns it. Nine-tenths, remember her, you've heard this before, nine-tenths of possession, all right, is nine-tenths of is you if you have it at your house, all right. But it's owning to trump the legal basis of these two. Because this one is going to dominate, this one is going to devour, but this one is going to own. 
And he's going to become indispensable to every human on earth in their economy, where they live, where they stay, their life. Because he will try to own it. He's different from the rest. But there's also some characteristics here. He has ten horns, right? What's a horn in the Bible? What does a horn mean? I'm not talking about a trumpet. What's that? A kingdom? Yeah, horn is authority. Okay, horn is authority. In the news this week, there was a lady, uh, it wasn't in um, Wyoming, but in an open park where there were uh, a buffalo. And she wanted to get a close-up of the buffalo. The buffalo, the, the word when you're, you're injured by a horn is what? You were gored, right? And it's authority. It's about owning. These pictures, Daniel knew what a horn was. He knew what it represented. And it was to such an extent, it says that while I was thinking, so he's been looking, he's been beholding, he's been looking a bunch more, and now he's thinking about the horns. He's contemplating these horns. Behold, another horn, a little horn, came up among them. And three of the previous horns were plucked out before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like a human and a mouth uttering great boasts. These boasts were against God. You'll see this in Revelation. Same boasting. Same little horn. So King Kong is grabbing, possessing, stomping through town, making everybody worry about their money, making everybody worry they're going to take the mark of the beast, make everybody worry about what's going on. But if, well, that's the one you've got to watch out for, folks, is the horn, the little horn. Because that's the Antichrist. Talks about that later. Whoever hits that section will get a, a hammer it, bring it home. And this picture, this vision, this dream that Daniel has, man, he pulls all the parts together, doesn't he? He doesn't make one more than what he saw. He doesn't make one less because he wasn't interested in that. He brings to us a testimony from God's mouth that from what? 500 years before Christ, to this present hour, we've had these symbols, this scripture. But most likely in our time of history will be some form of culmination, if not the culmination, of what's being portrayed. And it's based on God trusting somebody to steward this in such a way or not a comma or a, a letter was left out. That we find ourselves still chewing on what's happening with these beasts. All right, they're all beasts. But really, the message starts to come down to our participation with Him in our hour. Not to be nervous. This is not, none of this is about being nervous. Because what? The judgment, folks, is in favor of the saints. I gave it away. Sorry. What do they call that in the movies where you give away the plot? Oh, what is it? Spoiler alert. I'm giving you a spoiler alert. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I see you gazing at those dark clouds out there. This is not what we're doing. We're not gazing at, man, this is going to be tough and hard. And it's going to be what? It's going to push me out of my comfort zone. It's going to do all that. But it's going to push you into the arms of the Christ who saved you. 
It's going to push you into, into in being in his word and asking the Holy Spirit to fill you in such a way that your life is better than it was before. Feeling's not a one-time deal, folks. But there's this testimony for us in this hour. I envy Michael, and uh, next week Michael will be hitting this ninth verse. Brother, that's a chunky piece of scripture. That's Greek, and that's a Greek word, chunky. All right. So, in looking, in pondering, last week I sent you home, man, spend some time looking at this. Spend some time asking. Spend some time asking God about his spirit. Spend some time in the word about, man, okay, I see these things. But, Lord, you're saying that these things are not going to happen over there behind the something. It's going to happen right in our world. It's already happening in our world. And we find ourselves as Christians looking so often at other people. But you know what? Maybe some of you wouldn't mind if I called you at 2 in the morning. But not if I did it like a bunch. And yet God does, is not bothered by you crying out to him. No matter what time of day it is. So that's all the farther we're going to go today folks. And that peace of being a good steward. That peace of the spirit. That peace of understanding I can what? I can quench him. That piece of taking a look at, man, this is not, this is about judgment. This is about the, the, the last moments of a worldly kingdom giving away to a heavenly king. So let's pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you for who you are. We ask that, Father, you would be glorified by your word is glorious, Lord. I just ask that you would minister to every heart, Lord. Yes, we're all praying for our children and our grandchildren. Yes, we're praying for our co-workers, our neighbors. Yes, we're praying for a world that doesn't see any of this happening. And yet, Father, every day is impacted by its happening. So, Lord, we just ask that, Father, you would sober us up. Sober us up, Father, that uh, the American way and, Father, the way we grew up, things are happening that are different than that doesn't mean that those things are unimportant. It just, li- Lord, means we need more of a kingdom view than, Father, a natural view. And so we honor you, God. We thank you. How merciful you are to us, God, in Jesus' name. Father, we bless you and we thank you. That, Father, you know our hearts so deeply that there is no uh, part of us you don't know altogether. And that, Father, our role with other people comes, Father, from your living inside of us to such a degree that, Lord, we don't represent the best of our family or even the best of our intentions, Lord. We, we represent a king of kings who is the God of all comfort. Father, he's, the, he's a powerful God. And, Father, he raises up uh, the lame. Father, he heals the blind eyes and he raises the dead. And we just thank you, Lord, that we are those that, Father, not only seek you, but, Father, we rejoice in the finding. And so, Lord, we ask that you would equip us, Lord. Give us a heart of a disciple. That, Father, we, yes, we know a lot. Yes, we can't run that fast anymore. But let us be the heart of a learner, Father, that this doesn't consume it. But, Father, just floods out of us, Father, to a world that, Father, only has the thinking of what's up front here and not yours. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Saving my soul, thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Go in grace. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Don't